put out a call for suggestions for Roland Rambles, and David Vanderclaw had a most excellent one. The creep of what even is an operating system anyway? Back in the day, when you, uh, when you had DOS, for example, the operating system was this very minimal layer. It was just enough code to abstract out some very basic things so that you could do file management or device management or whatever, but it was pretty much the bare minimum. You can't get that much more minimal than MS-DOS. Um, although you can, Commodore BASIC and the kernel ROMs back in the days of the PET or C64 or, you know, take your pick, any of the early microcomputers, <clears throat> they had a very simple operating system um, that by modern standards isn't even an operating system, it's just the basic programming language and some extremely simple assembly calls. But, you know, that technically was still an operating system. So, in the early days of computing, an operating system was pretty straightforward. It was just enough code to support whatever software so that the software could do common, you know, sometimes system-specific things more abstractly, sometimes just common tasks. Um, but you can think of an operating system as a method of standardization of things. However, what we have today goes so far past what one might call an operating system. See, in the old days, an operating system was software that you used on your computer to abstract out and make common tasks um, commonly, you know, basically just shared code the, and uh, hardware abstraction. But nowadays, operating system doesn't mean what you need to, so programs can run on your computer but instead it's become what you need to actually do things with your computer. When you install Windows and it fires up, what do you have? You have Windows. But what else do you have? Notepad, WordPad, although I, I hear they axed that recently, but you know, Notepad, WordPad, uh, registry editor, you know, there's all kinds of software that's included in most operating systems. Even then, a lot of that software is part of the standardization, but we've gotten to the point now where when you install an operating system, there are whole suites of programs that aren't needed by other programs on the system in any particular way. For example, Microsoft Edge. No one needs Microsoft Edge. Just like no one needed Internet Explorer. Edge and Internet Explorer were the best way that you had, or, or have for that matter, to go on the Internet, download something that isn't Edge or Internet Explorer, and run that instead because both of them suck. So Edge, Internet Explorer, things like that, they're not strictly part of the operating system. Though it is difficult to download a browser without a browser to download with. Um, so to some extent, we can kind of give them that. But God almighty, couldn't it at least be something minimal enough that you could go get a proper browser? And th there is this nasty creep of what is an operating system. Like at this point, the way things have gone, you would think Microsoft Office is part of Windows. You would think that it is part of the operating system. You would think that Teams and OneDrive and all this other stuff are part of Windows, that they're part of the operating system. It's impossible to avoid Microsoft sneaking OneDrive onto your computer. Windows Updates used to do it. If you install Microsoft Office, oh, I'm sorry, Microsoft 365, because we're not calling it Office anymore. For some reason, we're just calling it a number, uh, even though it's not the version number. Uh, what is it, like Lotus 123, except you can't count? Anyway, you know, they'll shovel OneDrive on there, and somehow OneDrive is a, is a critical part of the operating system, except I throw it away every chance I get. Every customer that has it, I ask them, do you use this? Do you need this? Do you want this? Uh, can I just get rid of it, please? And I do. If I can get rid of OneDrive, I get rid of it. If I can get rid of Teams or Skype or all the games that come pre-installed with Windows, I do it. But we, we can go even further than that. 
there's software that is in Windows that isn't those things, which have a pretty clear delineation. OneDrive, you can uninstall. You can just get rid of it. Edge, you can't uninstall because they're jerks, but you kind of can uninstall Edge. It, it's just not straightforward. You have to be administrator sneaky to do it. So you can't remove those th that thing, but it, it doesn't matter. Um, if you go further down, what else is included in Windows that isn't actually part of the operating system? Windows Mail, don't need it. Just like Outlook Express, didn't need it. We don't need a mail client in Windows. Uh, Edge exists, so you can go get something else, basically. Uh, Windows Mail is not needed. Now, the Microsoft Store, Winget, all these package managers for Windows, not needed. If I have a browser, I can download the software myself. I don't want Microsoft managing a repository of software for me, forcing automatic updates on me. None of that's part of an operating system. Arguably, even Windows Update is not part of the operating system. Now, I am aware that in a modern world with more threats than ever, that security updates are s theoretically important. And therefore, quite a few people, especially businesses or people with a lot more to lose than I have, are going to run security updates and are going to want to be able to run security updates from within the operating system. But in general, updates are not something that has to be in the system. You, you used to get major Windows updates in the form of service packs. Of course, this was before everything was online, um, but service packs were major updates that fixed a bunch of stuff. And that was fine for a long time. That was even fine in the days of Windows 7. You know, a lot of people were fine with that. There's so much. And Linux is not free. Now, make no mistake. You, you think of Linux and BSD and all that stuff as, well, these systems are free from that. No, no they're not. What comes by default if you unpack Linux Mint? There's a billion languages you're not gonna use. Hey, guess what? This is gonna be tough to stomach, but I'm an American in America. I speak US English. I read, write, proofread, hyphenate, etc. US English. I don't care about Spanish. I don't care about French. Catalan, Afrikaans, I don't care about any of this stuff. All I need in any of my stuff is English. I don't need all these extra locales, I don't need all, all that bloat. That's not what the operating system should do, and if I need it, okay, fine. But you do not have to install every language on the planet into my operating system. It's not necessary. I picked a language during setup, all that other stuff is not part of the necessary stuff for the operating system. Stop including it. LibreOffice. Yes, I love LibreOffice. I love that there's a free Office suite. It's about 90% compatible or whatever. But I love that there's a free Office suite that you can get easily. What I don't love is that it's basically forced on you if you install any modern Linux distribution. <clears throat> it doesn't ask you if you want it. You, it just gets shoveled in there. There's all this stuff that doesn't go there. But let's go below applications. Forget LibreOffice or Firefox or whatever weird variant of Firefox that it, it has, you know. Forget all the application level stuff. Let's go further down. System D. Oh boy, I'm touching that. Yes, I am. I hate System D. I've always hated System D. And people who like System D think people like me who prefer not System D are idiots. And I can understand that. But my problem with System D is that it does not follow the Unix philosophy. Not the like mystical Unix philosophy that's sort of vague and like, eh, just do things the way they've been done. No, that's just some conservative software bullshit. But there is a major argument to be made for something that is lightweight, compact, and so on, you do not need a full network management suite inside of a program that is used to boot up the system and start services concurrently. It's not necessary. You know, a lot of people point to it and go, oh look, it makes the system boot faster because System D can resolve service dependencies and start services in parallel instead of in series. Well, okay, why does it need all this, all this crap in it 
you know, all this network, you know, direct, whatever. Why does it need all this other integration crap in it? It doesn't. And that's the problem with it is that it does not need all that to do that thing. It's like if something does a good thing, but it does other things wrong or poorly or bad. Oh, well, you can't have a problem with this thing because it does this good thing. And if you want to do this good thing, you need this and not your antiquated, stupid, old school, gray beard, idiot version of a system initialization program. No, you need, you need this new thing. Otherwise, how are you going to get parallel services started up? Well, I don't, I, I don't want to basically be running this one, like, solid user land inside my initialization binary that does all this stuff. You know, it's consumed, it's consumed the DHCP stuff, the DNS stuff. It's, none of my system initialization should do that. That is something for my startup services to handle, not your stupid initialization process. None of that is necessary. I should not need a network connection anything in my initialization stuff. That's not what an operating system, that's not what the lower level of the operating system like that should do. There, there's this notion of appropriateness and it just seems to be missing. And you know, it's kind of like Microsoft with their Windows, like the fast startup thing. You know, the fast startup assumes that it's okay to freeze file systems at that, and that there's no way you're gonna unplug that external drive or boot another system or whatever when you shut down your machine. Oh, by the way, you shouldn't shut down your machine, you should just sleep it. Every three minutes, which is what it seems like the default power profiles do. But like all this stuff that's smashed into the OS, like the mail control panel, why is there a mail control panel built into the operating system? You know, the operating system should provide basic services, not all this other stuff, like it, this superfluous crap. And if it's there, if you give me an optional thing, I should be able to throw it away. I should be able to say, you know what? I don't really want that, no thanks, and get it off my machine. But no, no, Windows is a take it or leave it, here's a bunch of crap system. Linux now is a take it or leave it, here's a bunch of crap system, even Mac OS, Take it or leave it, bunch of crap. BSD, uh, arguably, you know, BSD, you can end up with a very minimal system if you install it right. But, you know, maybe BSD's doing some things right there. Uh, frankly, it's been a while since I've booted one up, so I can't really speak to it. But the notion of what an operating system should do has slowly crept over the past 20 or 30 years into the application space in the worst way possible. And I understand that every single one of these encroachments is generally justified by some sort of, well, if we do this, then that logic. But here's the thing, that's not what an operating system should do. Edge should not be an integral part of an operating system. Internet Explorer should not be an integral part of the operating system. It never should have been in the first place. But it was. Since Windows 95, Internet Explorer components were available for applications to use, and they used it. Even though HTML and CSS and JavaScript and all that is not an appropriate way to build an interface for a program. And every program's built with it at this point. Everything's friggin' Electron. Stupid framework where every program's technically a web application running on a web server client fusion it's, it's insane. That's where you get whenever you decide, ah, operating systems should do literally everything. Like, what is the point of application software if the operating system is this huge, fat, slobby thing that does everything? In fact, here, here's a fun example too, and I'll let this go. I build Linux kernels for my Tritech service system distribution, if you will. Um, that I use to boot machines, do file system work. I just fixed, I, I recovered a guy's data by fixing a partition table today. <clears throat> but I boot these custom kernels I build and in them I throw away drivers that I'm never gonna use or that I, are very unlikely I'll use. I don't compile everything as a module because it's not necessary. And my kernels are faster and smaller than the kernels that come with most Linux distributions because most Linux distribution kernels come with literally 
every single thing that the kernel supports compiled into the kernel as either a module or integrated in. Mostly as a module, because guess what? Oh, I can, I can yank the code module. If I, if I don't need it, I just don't load that module. Except, if you've ever actually gone into the kernel and, you know, like looked at the code or done any kind of work in there, you realize that if you insert a, if you add a module, it's not as simple as, well, if the module's not loaded, then it has no effect. Modules have dependencies on other modules. Modules have dependencies on features that can't be turned off that are integral to the construction of the kernel. It's not that modular. It's not that simple. If you compile out certain things entirely, then there are whole piles of other things that simply don't get loaded into the system in the first place. They aren't there. They aren't compiled in. You reduce the code size. You reduce the distance from one piece of code to another, which means you decrease cache misses. You increase performance. Things go faster when all this extra tracking, accounting, processing, whatever, that you'll never use is never built in in the first place. And if most people aren't going to use it, why is there not a Linux kernel in these distributions that's like, most people don't need this stuff, so this kernel comes with a bunch of stuff turned off, and if you're a nerd that likes things quicker, you can pick the let's not be a slow POS kernel. Yeah, it, it, Linux kernel, the, the, there's even bloat in the Linux kernel that I can't, um, I just, it amazes me. Like, there's, there's a JIT compiler for the BPF framework, and it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Linux, the, even just the kernel at this point, is in and of itself sort of a program in a lot of ways. They have built a, a in-kernel um, SMB or CIFS, you know, Samba, the Windows file sharing system. They've created an in-kernel uh, Windows file sharing system um, driver. So you can share files out of your computer over Windows file sharing with a native kernel driver. That's always been the domain of userland programs. But now, instead of userland programs, it's, it's rapidly becoming the domain of, um, of the, the kernel. It's like, cram everything in the damn Linux kernel, apparently. And I don't, I just don't understand it. Why must everything get so big? And the fact that I can compile a lot of this stuff out and it becomes more efficient, that's pretty amazing. Hey, um, I'm, this is the last thing I'm gonna say, then I gotta go buy a bunch of wood. Because, you know, even though I'm a big man and I've got plenty of nice, big, clean wood, uh, I still have to buy more. But I compiled the Linux kernel and one of the things I noticed, this is an example of the kind of creep of crap into things. They added a feature to the transmission control protocol, TCP. Every website that you ever use, every web application in general you ever use requires TCP. They added a feature called TCP Fast Open, which lets them, it's, it stores like a, like a cookie. I don't remember all of the details, but basically when you open a TCP connection to a server, they give you a unique value or something. And they can, you can use that value to, on subsequent opens, um, TCP connection opens to the server, you can skip the full handshake just by throwing this cookie at it or whatever. I don't, I don't remember all the details. What I do remember is that when they added that, it created a hard dependency on the AES crypto module in the kernel for TCP. The vast majority of things don't even support this TCP fast open thing. But the TCP fast open stuff is in the kernel. Whenever a, whenever a TCP connection is set up or whatever, the TCP fast open logic has to be done. It at, at a minimum has to run a check. It's like, are we doing a fast open on this? Yes or no. And then the AES stuff is there and you can't get rid of it or you can't use any TCP stuff, which means you can't really network with much of anything. It's bloat. It's just bloat. And this is how it works. There's no option to turn off TCP fast open. So you're stuck with it. But even if I went in there and did forcibly try to remove it, I would have to pull out everywhere 
that relies on it. Every single thing that does that. I'd have to manually pull the dependency on AES. I'd have to manually rip out the fast open code. And over time, that becomes a nightmare because as the kernel changes, your patch has to change too. That removes this fast open crap you don't even need. How much does it slow it down? I don't know. Maybe one day I'll, I'll run some kind of really stupid benchmark to find out if TCP is really sped up enough by tossing the fast open stuff out of the window. The bottom line is I don't want fast open, I don't need fast open, but it's forced upon me I can't turn off fast open. AES is built in because fast open is force enabled and the logic that does the work is also forced in there. No, I, I, I get why it's available, but no. God, I could talk about software bloat for years, but I gotta go buy me some wood. Thanks for listening. Like, comment, subscribe, you know the drill. Take care.